Hi everybody and welcome to our next lecture. This lecture is going to focus on interest rates and equities. A quick overview of the lecture. We're going to begin by talking a little bit about interest rates and you know, what these are and what comprises them. And um, it, it will stay at kind of a high level, but we need to understand it a little bit. Um, and then after that, we're going to talk more about equities. We'll define the term, talk a little bit about stock markets, and then spend the bulk of the time valuing equities. Then we'll wrap up. So let's start with interest rates. In the previous lectures, I kept using this term interest rate. And it, it appears to mean different things depending on the use. Um, and unfortunately, this is often the case in finance. There are actually many terms for the same concepts. Um, and there are multiple concepts that sometimes use the same term. Um, and this is, this is unfortunate, but this is the reality of, uh, of the field. So for us, um, I want to try and define certain terms that we use over uh, a little bit more narrowly. So, for example, back when we were looking at bond calculations, uh, the market interest rate, which was the denominator, we, we mentioned the discount rate in our time value of money analysis, uh, that was also known as the yield to maturity, uh, the YTM. Sometimes that's just called the yield. Um, so it's got a few different terms there, but it's basically, it's, uh, we can think of it as the yield to maturity if we hold the bond to maturity. Um, but we'll also use the term the discount rate, um, which is a very common substitution for the, the denominator, the, the interest rate that we see in the denominator of the time value of money calculation. So to make it even more confusing, there are many different interest rates in an economy. So for example, there's the interest rate that the government is charged to borrow money which is typically going to be lower than the interest rate that I'm charged on my credit card, for example. Companies with good investment opportunities and a lot of cash on hand and low risk are going to have lower interest rates for their corporate debt than companies with few growth opportunities and no cash and you know, high perceived risk. So interest rates for the exact same securities even will change over time. And interest rates of identical, identical securities, um, except with different times to maturities, will also have different interest rates. So there's a lot of different interest rates and they're constantly changing in the economy. But we can make some generalizations um, and that's really what we're gonna focus on. In, in all these cases, the interest rate is typically it's going to increase when a given risk increases and it's going to decrease when a given risk decreases. So the basic idea is when we're faced with multiple investments or lending opportunities, if we're not compensated for additional perceived risks, then we're just going to put our money into something that's less risky. So we need to be induced to invest or lend to the riskier opportunity or the riskier situation with the promise of higher returns. So we can actually think of the interest rate as a function of a different num of, a, of a number of different factors. Um, the base level is the prevailing real interest rate. Sometimes it's called the real interest rate. And on top of this, we have things like inflation risks or inflation expectations. We might have repayment or default risk expectations. There might be liquidity risks that we're compensated for. Uh, and then there are other risk factors. And these are all sort of baked in to the interest rate. So in our previous lecture, last week, we did an example of a five-year bond and we saw what happened if we discounted it at 
3%, 5%, and 7%. So it was the same bond, but we discounted it at different rates, and we came up with different present values. So we can actually go ahead and interpret, potentially, why we might have applied a different discount rate. So for example, we might apply a higher rate, the 7% rate, if we're concerned that the company might not actually make the payments. Right? This is a default risk. Or maybe we're concerned that inflation is going to increase while we're holding on to this bond, and we need extra compensation for that. Uh, or maybe on the other side, we actually think that the market as a whole has gotten less risky. Maybe overall, the interest rates set by the federal government have declined. So we will apply this lower rate then to the company that's issued these bonds. Or maybe just the company itself has gotten less risky. So we would have to really examine the details, but we can make sense of it conceptually by linking the, the higher rate to the higher risk and so on. So the, the main conclusions, we're going to actually spend uh, another lecture talking in much more detail about the concept of risk and how do we calculate the required returns for that. Um, but the main concept from this brief overview of the interest rates is the lower an interest rate, the higher a bonds or any securities price is today, or conversely, the higher the interest rate, the lower the bonds price today. Um, and higher interest rates have built in additional compensation compared to lower interest rates. The additional compensation is going to relate to some type of additional perceived risk related to the underlying cash flows. All right, so now let's move on to equities. So let's just start by defining what these things are. Equity securities or common stock this represents ownership in a corporation. So common stockholders are really residual claimants. So they have a claim to the cash flows of a company only after all other claimants, for example, employees, suppliers, lenders, the government, um, after all these parties have been paid. If there's anything left over, the equity holders get this. So now at any point in time, the market value of a firm's common stock depends on a number of different factors. So it might depend on the company's profitability, the company's growth potential, and current market interest rates, for example. Now, We've talked a little bit about markets in our bond lecture. I want to return to this and talk more about stock markets. That's typically what we think about when we think of markets. A lot of times the first image that comes to mind is the stock markets. So stock exchanges provide liquidity, which is the ability for owners of common stock to convert their shares into cash at any time. And this is really a, one of the critical roles that markets play. If you don't, if, if your stock isn't going to be liquid, there's going to be a lot less demand for it. And stock markets provide that. So this allows buyers and sellers to come together and transact with each other uh, at any moment, and it really gives them confidence that they can buy or sell shares at will. Um, some examples are the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, um, the London Stock Exchange, these are some of the bigger ones. Uh, there's also private trading floors that most of the major banks have. Uh, these are less known, but they're an integral part of the financial system. Um, so for example, on this next slide, here is a, a, a picture of the world's largest private trading floor. Uh, it's the size of a couple of football fields. It's located just outside of New York City. Uh, and your narrator spent a couple of months on this floor working uh, right about where the arrow is. So this is just an example of, of what these stock exchanges might look like. 
All right, so now let's talk about stock valuation. This is, um, we spent quite a bit of time on bond valuation when we talked about bonds, and I want to have a similar discussion for stock valuation. And, you know, as we've talked about earlier in the course, really the heart of what we're doing in this course is trying to understand finance through the lens of valuation. And one of the key lenses is stock valuation. So we're really going to take a stab at it over the next few minutes here, just to kind of set the stage. And ideally, we spent all this time, the last couple of weeks, working on this time value of money tool. So really, we'd love to try, ideally, and use that tool, which worked so well for bond valuation, and apply it to stocks. Um, so for example, when we valued bonds, we discounted the promised future payments of the bonds by an appropriate discount rate, and we were able to get the present value of the bonds, you know, the market price. So we'd love to do something like that for stocks, um, but we have a problem, which is the stock, for stocks, the issuer hasn't promised any specific payments, right? For bonds, we were told explicitly. For stocks, we don't have that. So it's not really obvious what values we should use for our future cash flows. Again, this is the numerator of the time value of money analysis. So this makes it a little bit harder to value stocks through a time value of money, right? We don't really, we don't know exactly what this numerator is, but it's not impossible. So let's just take a first cut at this. And let's say we're trying to value a company stock in which we expect a dividend to be paid. And not all companies pay dividends, but let's just say we're working with a company where we, it has a history of dividends. So we can look at their historic dividend payments to get a sense of how much the dividends in the future might be. Well, we have to make some assumptions, but that's okay. So let's assume that the company is somewhat mature and the dividends are going to be expected to be the same forever. Um, so if we assume a dividend, let's just put some numbers here, of $2 per share based on the historic value, what we're saying is that, and let's just say these are annual payments just to make the math a little easier. So what we're saying is we expect $2 every year forever. This is a perpetuity, and we talked about this a little bit in the time value of money. So how do we value a perpetuity? Well, let's just uh, visually see what's going on here. Right? So we have year one, year two, year three, and we just keep doing this. Um, and the way we value this is the present value of the perpetuity is equal to the annual payment, $2, divided by the discount rate. All right, so we need a discount rate. And let's just say we're, we're, we believe the discount rate is 12%. So it's $2 divided by 12%, which is 1667. So a fair price for this stock, given these assumptions, is just under $17 today. All right, that seems reasonable. That's, that, you know, we were able to, through some somewhat simple assumptions and simplifying assumptions, we actually could use this time value of money tool to come up with a value, uh, a methodology to value stocks. This is actually known as the dividend discount model. So we can build on this and make it a little more robust. Let's just say, for example, uh, this company is actually growing. In the previous example, the dividend was $2 forever. So let's add a little bit of growth. So let's just say there's a constant growth rate, G, um, represented by G, and we can apply the perpetuity, the growth perpetuity formulation. So this is the present value equals the dividend this year times the growth rate, 1 plus G, divided by the discount rate minus the growth rate. 
So we, we really can just plug in our values into this equation. And let's just say our growth rate is 3%. When we do the math, we get a present value of 2289. So let's just compare these first two examples. With a constant dividend, we had a value of 1667 today for the stock. With constant growth of 3%, we had a value today of 2289 for the stock. So what that means is that growth gave us an extra $6.22 per share of value, or 37% more value by growing at 3% annually. So the conclusion from that, of course, is growth is good. Right, and this is actually why managers of companies are constantly trying, or at least encouraged, to grow their businesses. Um, if it's exactly for this reason. The growth gets factored into our valuation and increases the present value of the stock. So just to recap this, the main ingredients of a stock valuation when we use the time value of money, really there's just a few things that we need. We need an estimated dividend or some type of cash flow value for our numerator. We need a discount rate for our denominator and oftentimes we need uh, or will include some type of growth rate um, and depending on how you do the calculation that would actually appear in uh, potentially both the numerator and the denominator. So we can actually extend this valuation model and there are many extensions to it. Um, the most common extension is we can split our time horizon into two parts. Typically, when you do this, you have a high growth phase in the early years, followed by a, a slow but steady, more constant growth phase from, you know, from then on out after the first few years. And so we can think of it as just a high growth period plus a steady growth period. And by doing it this way, we can really, we can get more accurate on a year by year basis for that high growth period. And we can just value each period separately using the, the prior methodology and then add the components together. All right, so this really was a, a, a fast, high-level uh, walkthrough of equities. Um, so just a quick recap. If there's any residual value after paying back all outstanding obligations, the payroll, taxes, debt, etc., that is going to be then owned by the shareholders. Uh, we saw that equities are bought and sold in stock markets, just like bonds are bought and sold in bond markets. And most importantly, we can value stocks by taking the present value of any future estimated dividends or cash flows. We can factor in growth, and then if we have a discount, an appropriate discount rate, we just discount those back to the present. 